Oh my god, does this unit ever end? Answer, yes, today. Now you know all of these industrial changes don't just affect economics. All of society is affected. I'm talking about whole new classes of people, new roles for middle class and working class women, and social challenges like pollution and poverty and crime and disease, public housing, infrastructure. So today, let's review society in the industrial age. <music> Alright, so we've been talking about the Industrial Revolution for like a week now. But today let's focus on what happens to society as a result of all this industrialization. Society's a big, big category here in AP World History. We use it a lot. But don't let it be one of those words you don't know. It just means the people. How does all of this affect people or different groups of people? And the Industrial Revolution definitely affected the people. The College War breaks it down into three big sections, so let's go. First section, new social classes. Remember the French Revolution? The College Board doesn't because they erased it from the curriculum. Sacre bleu. But that revolution highlighted the disparity between the social classes left over from the medieval era. I'm talking about the three estates. The first estate, clergy. The second estate, nobility. And the third estate, everybody else. All with the king at the top. That was 1789. And the new social classes that emerge on the other side of the Industrial Revolution are very different than the three estates that preceded the French Revolution. That old estates model of peasants and nobility is done. There's a new industrial world order. Urbanization and factories have changed the shape of the planet, and that means big changes for the social classes as well. First, don't say rich people, poor people, children, use your words. Those people in control of the factories or the wealth, what we're now calling the means of production, are called the bourgeoisie. This literally means city dwellers. Now in the French Revolution, they were the skilled group of people in the third estate that just weren't noble, so they lacked privilege. But the political and industrial revolutions of Unit 5 reshaped the meaning of the word bourgeoisie. Now the bourgeoisie are the wealthy, powerful people in control of the means of production. So on the other side of the bourgeoisie, you have the workers. Now don't call the workers peasants anymore because that's kind of a medieval term. Instead, use the industrial term proletariat. All those pictures your teacher showed you of factories or slums or tenements, yeah, that's the proletariat. The word goes back to ancient Rome and they were the lowest class of people in Rome. Think wage laborers who live and work in the factories in those urbanized cities. Okay, so you've met the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. But what about the new class structure? At the top, the ruling class. This used to be reserved for nobility, but now it's anyone with wealth and power that runs things. For example, of the eight richest people in the early modern period, 1750 to 1900, seven of those people are in the ruling class. Only one of those would have been left over from the aristocracy. Okay, so the ruling class is at the top. Now let me check to see what that class in the middle is called. In the, let's see, it's called the, ah, the middle class. Clever. There's a million definitions you can find online, but let me give you the best definition of the middle class I've ever heard. And this comes from the 1913 British Registrar's specifications as to what it means to be in the middle class. So to be in the middle class, if you yourself are in control of human capital, meaning you have people working for you or directly beneath you, but you are still dominated by those ruling classes, congratulations, you're in the middle class. The new name for the lower class, the one that's doing all the working is, let me just double check, ah, the working class. You'll find a myriad of definitions here to describe this one, but let me give you my favorite for the working class. So if you're in that working class, you sell your labor for wages, but you don't control any of those means of production. In other words, you do physical labor, but you don't own the factory and you don't own the land. Congratulations, you're in the working class. Here in the working class is where you will find the proletariat. Okay, so enough about class. The next big social change the College Board wants you to know about is women and children. The big change for working class women in this period is the shakeup of home life. Instead of most of your family working on a farm growing crops to live on, the men, the women, and the children are now all working in the factory. And that's a huge change from the last every period in history until this point. But the College Board doesn't bring that up specifically by name. What they do bring up is what happens to middle class women. So as the middle class is emerging during the Industrial Revolution, what does that mean for women? And I'm talking about a new cult the cult of domesticity. Middle class women didn't need to work to feed their families, and neither did their children. So what governs the day-to-day -day lives of these new middle-class women? The culture or cult of domesticity. The cult of domesticity saw the woman's role as following the four virtues. First, piety, following Christian values. Second, purity. Third, submission, doing what they are told. Fourth, domesticity. The woman's place was in the home. By 1890, only 5% of married women were employed in full-time jobs. 
The middle class woman's job was keeping a nice home and raising the children. And finally, the last social challenge stemming from the Industrial Revolution are all the social challenges. It's kind of a long list from the College Board here, but these are all the negatives that your teacher went over and over with you as to what comes out of all of these factories and urban life. So don't forget that the Industrial Revolution as a whole did raise the standard of living, but there are a lot of negatives that come with this. These are things like industrial pollution, poverty, increases in crime, public health crises, housing shortages, and the overall lack of infrastructure in cities to handle all this new growth. So that was 5.9, Society in the Industrial Age. Way to end Unit 5 on a high note, College Board. That's it. We did it. Unit 5 is over. And that was a long unit, but the changes that we went through in Unit 5 are the biggest changes in the entire course. Unit 5 redirects history in a new direction, in an industrial direction, that will have huge consequences in the 20th and 21st centuries. can't leave this unit without talking to the MVP. Tomorrow, we meet the MVP of Unit 5. I'll see you tomorrow.